This is the first time I've done a conference like this, so I hope you'll bear with me. It's uh, not quite the first conference. About 30 plus years ago, as a young man working for Rentakill, I uh, was sent along at about two hours' notice to give a little talk to the Women's Institute. And so about 50 or, 50 or so ladies turned up to hear me talk uh, about the life cycle of the Anobium punctatum woodworm. So. Uh, I put my slides up and everything. Anyway, I got uh, I got their interest when I started talking about uh, the mating mating uh, habits of the death watch beetle, which, whose peculiarity is to bang its head on the wood uh, to make a tapping sound, uh, hoping for a response from uh, from uh, a another beetle, um, and uh, that that got their interest. Uh, it doesn't work for humans, by the way. That, that. Um, so I uh, hope you bear with me. Um, uh, I, when I was rehearsing for this f with myself last night, uh, I know I've got a 20 minute slot. Uh, my, I've given the talk on the webinars uh, a few times, and it usually takes 30 minutes. So I'm trying to hone it down. I've got it down to 15 minutes, and then the next one was 25. So I've no idea how long exactly it's going to take. Um, I, I've often sat down there and seen other people uh, start with a joke, but um, what I'll do is, if I've got time at the end, I'll tell you the quick joke. So, uh, without further ado, I hope I'm going to be able to work this okay. Oh, yeah, there we go. So, uh, I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to mention bream quite a bit, but actually, the principles talking about indoor air quality uh, are going to be relevant to any any refurb pro project. Uh, whether you're going for bream or not, but um, we uh, uh, indoor air quality start, uh, came into the the, the bream uh, uh, assessments in 2011, um, and last year we were contacted uh, by a, a, an assessor on behalf of bream to to ask us about how we how we help people get the credits, um, uh, because they they were finding that not many projects uh, actually targeted the credits under HEAO2. Um, so uh, we talked about that and uh, that, that's why we started doing the webinars to, uh, to help demystify, which I, ho I hope I'll, I'll be able to do today. So those are the things we're going to cover. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the testing uh, of air quality um, in buildings, uh, some, so I can tell you about some of the lessons we've learned over the last few years. Um, uh, before we get on to wh why I do it, we should, we should talk a little bit about what BREAM covers. Uh, it talks specifically about two pollutants, uh, or two groups of pollutants, uh, VOCs, which is volatile organic compounds, and formaldehyde. There are many potential pollutants in an, in an indoor environment, uh, and, the, and, and these range from dust particles uh, to carbon monoxide, uh, oxides of nitrogen given off by uh, burning hydrocarbons, so from f uh, f fuel like uh, it, boilers and what have you. Um, ozone, uh, microbes, so bacteria, fungi, uh, uh, yeasts and molds, uh, a big issue in America, uh, becoming more prevalent over here. Uh, but these, these uh, pollutants are not uh, specifically addressed by HEAO2. They are more to do with occupant-related uh, issues. So uh, today I'm going to talk sp specifically about VOCs and formaldehyde. So what is a VOC, volatile organic compound? Uh, there are many thousands of these. They are uh, basically a gas given off by something that is a solid or a liquid. So at room temperature and pressure, it, it becomes a gas. It's a smell. Um, and in, in the building world, uh, HEAO2 is directed at um, controlling uh, emissions from building products, specifically those related to finishing. Um, so these would be things like uh, plywood, uh, MDF, uh, adhesives, sealants, paints and varnishes, uh, ceiling tiles, certain types of floor covering. Uh, all of these will give off uh, gases uh, that might then affect people occupying the building, uh, using the building thereafter. 
So I'm going to hopefully demystify these, um, uh, the, these matters a little bit. So, uh, why, uh, so if you're going to go for the credits under Bream, um, why do it? First of all, you get Bream credits. Uh, but setting Bream credits aside for a moment, if you, if you, if you follow the principles under Bream, you, you are going to be able to prove that the indoor air quality was at the forefront of your considerations right from the start of the project. Um, it would help boost the image, the green image of the developer and the occupier. Um, and this is quite an important one, I think. It would be, you would be able to, if you carry out the testing, uh, this is prior to occupancy, but post-construction or refurb. If you carry out the testing and uh, assuming you get satisfac satisfactory results, you would be able to prove that, at least in terms of those pollutants that you've measured, that the building was, was not contaminated when you handed it over. Now that could prove really handy if later on, after occupancy, that building started to be associated with complaints about indoor air quality. So sick building might start getting mentioned, uh, sick building syndrome might start getting mentioned, and it might be very, very handy f to be able to go back and benchmark against the prior to occupancy. And having a building with indoor air quality taken into consideration right from the design stage um, will help to contribute to the well-being of people who use that building throughout its life. Um, and we all know that happy people uh, make productive people, so in a commercial environment. So what credits are available under, under HEAO2 if you are going through, through this for Bream? Uh, you can, there are generally five uh, cr credits, unless it's a simple or a shell and core project. Um, you can get one for having a compliant indoor air quality plan. Uh, you can get another one for designing the ventilation system in such a way as to minimize uh, concentration of these pollutants. And a third one is available for specifying uh, low emitting products. So you can buy products that are, have low VOC or zero, even zero, uh, f zero formaldehyde products. Um, and provided you specify these uh, and are able to prove that they were used, um, then you can claim a credit for that. A lot of people target this one at the outset, thinking, oh, there's an easy credit to be had there. But in reality, it can be quite difficult getting the paper trail to get it at the end of the project. Sorry, jumped on a bit. Uh, fourth credit is available for testing um, after, uh, after you finish the job um, before occupancy. Um, and then there's a fifth credit available for having adaptability with regard to f uh, natural ventilation. Um, today, uh, credits two, three, and five there are, are really to do with design uh, of the building, and we're not designers, so I'm not really going to talk about those. I will talk a little bit about the plan and about the testing and the lessons we've learned. So what should a plan include? Uh, the plan, first of all, should not be complex. Um, it, it should take into account where the building is. Uh, so if you're in a rural environment, your outdoor air quality is going to be very different to if you were in a, in a city. Um, you should also take into account the purpose of the building. So the measures that you might have uh, for a healthcare building would be very, might be more stringent, uh, especially in terms of monitoring, um, than you would have for a building that wasn't healthcare. Uh, the plan should act as a guide for designers. Um, if they follow general good practice and building regulations, then you know, they're going to be going a long way towards uh, complying with the credits requirements. Um, and the plan should focus on controlling uh, emissions from these pollutants, um, in particular uh, contaminant sources, so focusing on that list of approved products. We think the plan should also include uh, what happens after occupancy, so that you're really showing that you've made a consideration of that, and to design a program for appropriate monitoring after occupancy, monitoring of air quality, that is. And at that point, you can build into it these other pollutants of concern that, we, that may be of concern, so dust particles and microbes and other gases. Uh, the plan should also say, state, in our view, should say, state, 
specifically where you're going to take the tests from. So if you are going to do post-construction testing, there should be a, a, a thought at that stage about where the test should be done. done. Um, you don't need to test every room in the building. Uh, you only need to really theoretically test one room of each type of design. Uh, if you had a large office block, for example, and all the rooms were, were finished the same way, then um, in theory you could just test just one, but if it was a large building you'd probably test more, more than one of each type of room. You don't need to test areas that are not uh, occupied, or not occupied for long periods of time. So. Uh, areas that are transitory, like hallways or toilet areas or reception areas, unless there's a receptionist sitting there, uh, you wouldn't normally test in those areas, plant rooms and the like. Uh, that's a shot of um, testing actually taking place. Um, you've got a nice, clean uh, room there, all finished. There's nobody there putting on last minute applications of anything. Um, the test kit there. It's being used as, uh, believe it or not, several thousand pounds worth of kit, and we might set several of these up and run them concurrently. Uh, they have to run for several hours to draw in a known volume of air uh, at a known rate, a predetermined rate, which is pretty low flow rate. It has to be a low flow rate because if you draw it through too quickly, the reagent that is kept in a little glass tube. Um, won't take up all of the pollutant if you draw it through too quickly. So you have to set it at a, uh, a low flow rate, check, the, check it with the calibration equipment to make sure you, you know what the rate is, and then run it for a certain uh, several hours to, uh, to gather enough sample for the laboratory to analyze. Oh, we cover what's a VOC. Um, so, uh, Moving on to some lessons we've learned about the testing itself, um, uh, some do's and don'ts. Uh, so it's really important to coordinate with the project manager um, and to remain flexible on dates because if you're trying to get a scenario like you saw in the photo there where we've got a clear run at a room, and then uh, that's quite difficult to achieve on some projects, uh, a lot of projects, where they're usually running tight for time. Um, it's not very often where we get a completely clear run uh, in, you know, like, like was in the photo. Uh, we need to choose the, uh, the locations for the testing carefully because it's quite an expensive test. Um, there's laboratory analysis involved, there's a site visit obviously. Um, so we don't want to be taking tests unnecessarily. Uh, it's really important to flush out the building uh, be before d carrying out the testing. This is to get rid of any pollutants that might have built up during the construction process. Um, and then uh, uh, basically to flush out, you throw open all the windows and doors or run the ventilation system on its maximum fresh air, or, or maybe both. Um, and then overnight, you let the building settle back to normal to a normal environment. Um, and then come in the next day and do the testing. On the day of testing, you, you would want to walk around the building first to check that the locations are safe to access. Uh, the last thing you want there is to have a situation where you can't safely get to the, the test location. And also to have a look around and make sure there's nothing there unexpected going on that might be influencing the test results in a bad way. So, uh, any, for, for example, we had a site where we there was some people laying a road right outside the right outside the, the room we wanted to do the test in. Um, not surprisingly, the test result came back with a raised VOC. Um, and then, uh, obviously, be prepared to move the test locations to to avoid sources. So, if we, if we had found that and we realised the implication of it, then we might have moved, been able to move the test to uh, a, another another area of the building further away from that, as if there was one. Um, it's really important 
to comply with the methods that are stipulated in uh, HE A02. They're very specific about the w way they want the test done. There's a British standard to follow. Um, it requires a laboratory method. Uh, I know of at least three different ways of measuring VOCs um, and formaldehyde, uh, and they range from the complicated method specified in Bream to waving a magic wand around. Uh, literally electronic gizmo that you can walk into a room, wave the wand and get a virtually instant reading. Uh, that's not specified in, in, uh, in Bream. Curiously enough, if you were doing a SCAR assessment, I should, probably shouldn't mention that here, but if you're doing a SCAR assessment, you, um, you can use the electronic test method there. So those are some of the things you want to try and avoid. Um, and I, we quite often get asked, how, how long should you leave it from leaving a, using a sealant or something like that? before coming in to do the tests. Well, uh, we recommend three days if you can, if you can allow, if you can get that gap, uh, and then do the flush out the day before we come to do the test. Um, but even then, the, the off-gassing, it's called off-gassing, uh, the Americans have been doing some analysis on this, and they, they have found that off-gassing can continue for years after the installation, normally at a very low level. Um, now, when we're doing our measurements, uh, we are measuring and comparing the results against the limits given in Bream. Bream's limits are about a tenth of the UK uh, for formaldehyde. Um, in, the, in the UK, we publish a workplace exposure limit, uh, and that is a factor of ten times higher than the Bream standard. Uh, the workplace exposure limit would be what is deemed to be safe to work in. Um, so Bream's limit is a, a tenth of that. Nobody really knows the true health implications of these pollutants over a long period of time exposure at very low levels. So the, the, I, w I would advocate using low emitting products as much as you possibly can. Even if you get good test results, it doesn't mean that there aren't health implications going forward. So. To come back to the question about using sealants, I would suggest a three-day gap if you can get it. If you can't get it, well, you know, we have to go along and carry out the test still and note the fact that somebody's just used a sealant. Uh, some don'ts. Um, well, there we go. Don't apply sealants and varnishes and what have you. Um, don't allow new furniture to be stored in the, in the test locations um, or preferably anywhere in the building. Um, new, new furniture, this kind of stuff, uh, will give off gas. Um, so, um, so that might influence our test results. Um, we have turned up on projects to do testing, and there's a paint store there in 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 the building, uh, with paint lids not been refitted properly. So they're going to give off fumes. Um, Avoid carrying out air tightness testing uh, on the same day or for a few days before doing the VOC testing um, because the sealants that they use to complete the testing process will give off gases. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit now about testing um, uh, statistics and what we found. Prior to 2015, I'll speed up a little bit now. Um, Prior to uh, February 2015, we had a failure rate of about one in five tests. Um, this is a failure against the Bream standard. Uh, about half of those, we were able to identify a likely cause while we were doing the testing. Um, and this led us to drive harder on the do's and don'ts. So we we're giving stronger advice to project managers um, and making a specific call to them before we came to verify the start date for a start, but also to talk them through the do's and don'ts, please try to avoid this or this or this before we come. So as we drove harder on the do's and don'ts, um, the failure rate dropped um, and uh, down to one in eight. Um, and we can't seem to get it lower than that at the moment. So we, we, we started this webinar process to invite people on because you can't force them to come. Um, uh, I think people, a lot of people, project managers might still uh, ignore the advice. Uh, or they're running so busy that they haven't got time to implement it. 
Um, you can see there that, that we've still got 9% with no, no identifiable cause, so about 10% of them, we just don't know what the reason is for the failure. There's nothing there that is apparent, immediately apparent. Of course, it might be that they've used a product that is, is not low, em, low emitting, and that, that could be what's causing the, the failure. It's important to note that all the failures to date, I mean, you remember I was mentioning the workplace exposure limits to the, so the health and safety level. Uh, there is only a health and safety level published for formaldehyde. VOCs uh, that we, we would be measuring here, total VOCs, so, as I said, there are 10,000 or so of them, and uh, you're just measuring a total number. There is no UK exposure limit for VOCs. There's only some guidance issued by the EC. Uh, and we compare against those, those results. Uh, so far, none of the tests we've done, apart from one site fairly recently, uh, have, have been anywhere near those safe, what might be deemed safe limits. Um, so that's, that's good news. Um, uh, and I'm sure somewhere on here it says, that even if you get a failure with the test results, you can still claim the Bream credit, provided you implement the actions that we might recommend as a result of any failure. So if we f were doing testing for somebody and we found a failure, then we would be making recommendations about what to do. I'll come on to that slide in a minute. Um, but you can still claim the Bream credit, provided you carry out the, the actions. Got to speed up. Yeah, so what to do in the event of a testing uh, failure? Uh, this will depend on how many of the tests failed, what percentage of them failed, how badly they failed, and the sensitivity, sensitivity of the environment. So if they've just failed and they're in a healthcare setting, our reaction might be slightly different to if they were somewhere else. Um, and these recommendation options would include addressing any likely causes. So if we've seen somebody doing something, um, or something has been applied that we didn't really want to see applied, then you, you may be able to address that. It's ch chances are it's already been addressed. So if somebody was squirting sealant on, well, it's already, already, already been done. Uh, another option is to repeat the flush out process. It's a fairly simple thing to do, so why not do it? Uh, verification that products you used were low emitting. So they might have been specified as low emitting, but were they actually used? Or did halfway through the job they run out of a product and somebody shot off down to B&Q and bought the same color paint, but maybe not low VOC paint. Uh, and another option is to do retesting. You don't always have to retest. If you were following the lead thing, the US version of, what, can I call it the US version of Bream? Um, they, it's mandatory to do retesting if you get a failure in their scheme. It's not with the Bream thing. It leaves it open to interpretation. And we would try to avoid Bream uh, retesting whenever, whenever possible. Um, because the retesting environment is going to be different to when we did the testing in the first place, because you've probably got occupancy. Um, as I said there, Bream says that if you follow the recommendations, uh, you can still claim the testing credit. So should we retest or not? If you're going to do this, we would consider that the handover window may have closed, and people occupying a building will bring in VOCs. If we create VOCs. We spray on stuff. We put it on our faces, uh, our clothes give off VOCs, um, things that we do in, a, in our workplace or in our homes will create VOCs. Um, so you have to take that into account. If you're going to think about doing retesting, what sort of environment are we testing? So we would normally only re recommend retesting if the results showed a worrying level, in other words, close to or above the workplace exposure limits or those what are toxicity levels given by the EC. Uh, or if a high proportion of the tests have failed, um, or if there might be an ongoing problem that we might want to monitor rather than go into some expensive and disruptive remedial action, you might decide actually the best, most appropriate thing is let's monitor this for a while and see how much of a problem it really is longer term. There's a little bit of information about what we think, wh why, why you should consider doing monitoring in a building on an ongoing basis, some of the reasons you might do it there. I think that is a bit of summing up. 
Um, so uh, the credits are easier to attain than most people think. Um, uh, the design credits can be achieved by good design following um, building regulations in, in the main will get you a very long way down that road. Uh, specifying low VOC products is a very good thing, but you can sometimes have difficulty with the paper trail proving that proving it at the end, proving that they were used. Um, testing is a very achievable, relatively straightforward thing to do, um, but there is an issue about careful planning of the timing uh, and the conditions that you want to do the testing in. And a testing failure does not mean you can't claim the Bream credit. I hope that's demystified things a little. It's now 12.41, so no joke, I'm afraid. Right. <laughs>